I'm so excited. I thank you so much for being here again. I have been waiting for this moment. I've been waiting for us to come back and to do recordings. Cheryl, I am even more excited that you are here with yes, us. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. And I joke about this, but it, I, inside I really want to like get up and do interpretive dance just awesome. to express <laughs> Go for how it. happy I am that you are here with us. And the reason why I'm so happy is because I have been trying to stress the importance of multi-generational community and especially amongst women, how vitally important that is. And, and it truly is, according to the Bible, something that we have been looking at and studying in Titus is that as women, we are obligated, according to God's word, to teach the younger women. Right. So I look to you and automatically like, you're my teacher. Oh, you are sitting yeah. here at this table <laughs> as our teacher. So welcome, welcome, welcome. And because nobody has met you yet, I'm going to ask that you just introduce yourself and let all the women know who you are and what is up with Cheryl Foy. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't feel like a teacher. I will start with saying that. You are. Um, I just feel, I guess, blessed that I've lived this long, in a sense, um, to get to this point where, I don't know, I, don't, I never thought I would be, if that makes any sense. I just turned 60, and that's a number that's uh, bizarre and kind of confusing to me, because I've never been this old, so I'm not sure <laughs> what I'm supposed to be. Um, but I can... It, it, there is some peace in that, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I have uh, two kids, um, a daughter who is 28 and a son who's 32, which is weird to me, too. I don't know how they got that old, mm -hmm. but um, I've been married. This is my second marriage. I've been married 23 years, and um, God's been very faithful to get us to this point in that respect. Um I'm not sure what else you want me to share, except that I feel like I'm just continuing to walk the path that I feel like God's put me on, and whatever that kind of includes, I'm okay with in a way that I've never been okay before That's in awesome. my life. So it's kind of cool, but it's also a little scary because time is getting short. <laughs> oh, no. You're just getting more bold. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's the hope. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you for, for sharing that. And then, Erin, welcome back. Thank you. Because you have been here with us yes. since the very beginning. And just kind of give us a little refresher. Just remind everybody what life looks like for you currently, too. Yeah, so very newly married. My husband, Zach, and I were actually just talking about yesterday. Our one-year anniversary is coming up. Yay. So how do we want to celebrate? And yeah, uh, he's still working for the church. I work for a nonprofit, and we're really just, you know, figuring things out. That's going to be the state of being for us, mm -hmm. I think, for the next 20 years. <laughs> sure. Yes. It's normal. Yes. Okay, so just to kind of get us moving towards this next topic, um, really what we are after with all of these, these videos is to address the, the situations and the things that women are battling and what we're facing and just the realities of, of what life looks like for us. So before this ministry even came to be, when I was trying to figure out what is it that women are needing to hear truth you know, spoken into what areas of their life do they want to know what God has to say about X, Y, and Z, I decided to conduct a survey. And because the only way you're going to get those answers is to ask the women. So I put a survey out there, asked women to come on, answer these questions. Honestly, it was all anonymous. I don't know who answered what. I don't, I don't know any of that. But one of the questions I did ask was, as a Christian woman, and really this is just as a woman, period, mm -hmm. what do you struggle with the most? And the number one answer that came through was comparison. Mm -hmm. And it was stated in a way like comparing myself to other women, right. comparing myself to married women, comparing myself to other moms. Like it was in one form or another, but it all came back to comparison. So looking at comparison and just kind of understanding like what is the definition of comparison, and I even wrote it down so that I would know that it means examining the similarities and differences of two or more things, ideas, or people. 
So ultimately, when we are comparing ourselves to others or with others, it is typically done out of a form of jealousy, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we're going to look at is just how does comparison manifest itself in our own lives? And let's just give some truly honest, real, transparent answers of, hey, this is, this is how it shows up in my life. I'm not proud of it, but it's just, it's the truth. So Aaron, if you would not mind kicking us off. Go for do it. my best. <laughs> Um, Go for it. If I'm honest, comparison shows up in almost every way, shape, and form it could right now. It's a huge battle. I mean, like you just said, Gretchen, this is the number one thing women are battling right now. Um, So, yep, I'm right there with you. Mm -hmm. And so being newly married, I think that's where all of my comparison really lies right now. Just trying to figure out how do I measure up? How do I compare as a wife? And I think uh, coming from the South for Zach and I has played a lot into that. Um, I didn't grow up in that world, but being there for a few years, you just watch like all of my sweet friends that get married and they have these incredible men with their newly purchased home that's Mm -hmm. perfectly Joanna Gaines and they're shopping at Whole Foods and (laughs) I'm just, I I cannot figure out, I'm like, oh my gosh, my house looks like a bachelor pad. We will not have a bank account to own a home (laughs) and I don't know how long. Uh, I can barely curl my hair. It was like 25 burns (laughs) later that we got this look today and don't really know how to put on anything but mascara and I'm like, well, how many times is enough times to be having sex in a week to be a good wife and meeting his needs or cooking dinner every night or my car doesn't look a certain way and feeling even the shame of having people into my home because it doesn't look put together and homely right. or whatever that may be and also just physically coming out of a major surgery for me I think about what my body used to look like what I was physically capable of and even how that plays out in marriage too, you know? So again, just within that physical intimacy realm with my husband, I'm like, there are days that I physically feel like I cannot. I'm like, I'm going to disappoint him. Hmm. I'm going to be less than as a wife. And there's a gentleman, his name is T.A., and he's the director of a ministry at a and called Breakaway. And he actually taught on comparison. And it's where it really just like rose to the surface for me. And I saw it for everything it is in my life. And he said, we are all battling comparison. And it's going to be in the form of as or er. So are you as smart as or are you prettier or better? And I was just like, hmm. I struggle all over the board. Like, am I, am I as pretty as she is? Am I smarter than she is? Or... Or are we as rich at, oh, I don't know what that looks like, but I was Mm -hmm. like, oh, I feel the weight of this burden in my life right now. It's so heavy and it's so prevalent. Yeah, Yeah, I agree. I I can kind of relate to even the physical part, um, changes and things like that that come with age. It's kind of the same thing in a way. Like your your but your concerns about physical changes are different than mine and mm-hmm. that I'm just like trying to keep things moving. You know? <laughs> I just want to be able to continue to do the things that I used to do. So my ideal isn't real lofty, but it is I guess um more mechanical in a way that uh I've seen people in my age group, some of them just sit down and they're done mm-hmm. and that's that's the rest of their life. So I struggle to not do that because I, I see the results of that. And yeah. it's a comparison, I guess, in a way that is a negative toward me or maybe creates anxiety in me. Mm-hmm. But I I see that life and I don't want that life. So to me, it's kind of positive in a way that it motivates me to like, don't go there. Um, so the physical aspects, I can definitely relate. I don't know that that, that changes throughout your life. Well, it changes, but it's still there throughout your life for different reasons. Oh, that makes me feel like at least I'm not alone. And mm-hmm. yeah, I know, I know these things will continue to exist. It's almost just what shape will it take and how do I allow the Lord to teach me mm-hmm. what it doesn't need to look like in my life. Right. Mm-hmm. Totally agree. I fully agree with that because when I look at my own life and I see where comparison shows up and it is 100% everywhere. Mm -hmm. It is in every aspect of my life. I cannot avoid it. And as much as I want to say, oh, I don't have, I don't deal with comparison. It's just not true. Mm -hmm. And 
And that is a little disheartening, but at the same time, it's just honest. Mm -hmm. And so I, and I do, I go again with both of those. I will compare myself in my own favor to build myself up. So, and I do this, like it shows up in the grocery store. Not even kidding. I walk around with my grocery cart because I am a healthy woman and I take pride in my health. And I see my grocery cart full of fresh vegetation <laughs> and, and fruits and all these wonderful organic, non gluten free, non dairy, or non gluten free, non gluten, dairy free, <laughs> soy free, everything. And my cart speaks volumes for my life. Please don't ever look at my grocery cart. And who cart. I am. <laughs> yes, but then I see other women's grocery carts and I will compare myself so that I feel better. Like, oh yeah, no, no, no. Yes, they're, they're full of mac and cheese boxes and, and it's horrible. It's a horrible thing. And half the time I don't even realize I'm doing it. But I just walk out of the grocery store with this boost of pride and this confidence in myself that I am winning in the health department against other women. Well, and I think what you just said, too, you said, you know, sometimes we don't know that we're doing it if we really like cue into our train of thought. But that's part of how the enemy plays this against us. Like if we don't do this, mm -hmm. if we don't talk about it, if we're like, uh, I don't think there's anyone at this table or on the other side of this screen that can say, I don't battle this at all. If we're not talking about it, if we leave it in the dark, then he's going to continue to breed it to the point yes. that it's a habit that we don't even know it's happening and yes. not, not trying to fight back, I guess. Right? Yeah. I feel like though, the, the process of, um, going through decade after decade. Now I try to shop healthy and put good things in my cart, but there are a few things in there that are probably <laughs> not great. And yet yeah. I feel like I'm okay with that now where before I felt like I would have had to measure up to the standard that, yes. and I can maintain that my whole life. So I've kind of gotten a little more grace with some things and like, uh, I let things go a little easier. So I don't know. I'm not quite as rigid, but generally speaking, I try to measure up to my own idea of what I believe I should be doing rather than maybe somebody else as much. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like that's definitely a benefit of getting older is just uh, letting go of some of that stuff. And like, pff, if they want to eat that, you know, that's okay. Yes. Um, but that's not what I want to do for myself. But that sounds like a little piece of free. I'm like, oh my gosh, maybe I have hope. Maybe some of this will die down. Um, each I think each decade gets rid of things that you used to c compare yourself. Um, because like when you go through having ki you know, your kids, while the kids grow up, there's a comparison gone pretty much. Yeah. Um, when yeah. your marriage is 20 years into it, you know, compare your marriage to other people so much. Mm -hmm. You just let go. So you have fewer things, I feel like, to compare so much, which is um, a great gift. But there's still always yes. things. And there always will be things. So just this morning, I was listening to a message from one of my pastors, and he said this sobering statement about comparison, and I had to share. He said, comparison will sabotage your freedom. And I'm just going to say it one more time and just let this resonate with you. Comparison will sabotage your freedom. Doesn't that make you stop and think? because it definitely did me. And given the fact that this is what we are talking about, it probably gave me you know, more reason to pause and just mull over it and think over it. Because if we want to lock ourselves up and imprison our minds and bring our growth in God to a screeching halt, all we need to do is roll the comparison tape. And I know that we know that comparison is not a product of godliness. Quite the opposite, actually, because when we get caught up in comparing ourselves to others, it really is this ungodly habit. And even knowing that doesn't really change the fact that it is still such a difficult thing to break. So as with most other sins and ungodly behaviors, the very first place that we need to start is with identification. So I am just gonna pose the same question to you that I asked Cheryl and Aaron in the video. And that question was this, how does comparison manifest itself in your life? And so we each went around and just gave examples from our personal lives of how comparison is popping up for us. 
So again, what does comparison look like for you? Are you prone to comparing yourself favorably or negatively? And as Cheryl mentioned, are you able to look back over the course of your life and see how comparison comes in stages? Like it's just these different waves depending on where you are in life and what is going on. Are you a new mom and you are just stuck like comparing yourself to every other mother on the planet? Are you a newlywed like Erin that you're comparing every single aspect of your marriage and your home to your friends' marriages and their homes? Or are you kind of in the same boat as me? Do you allow yourself to go out like to the grocery store for crying out loud and you're comparing yourself to other women there? What does it look like? But be honest with yourself. We do not ever do ourselves any favors if we pretend or just water things down because we don't wanna face the reality of it. We want to face the reality of our comparison. And just remember that comparison will sabotage our freedom and the inability to admit how much that we, we have let comparison rule our lives and place restrictions on our Christ-given ability to be set free from it. And so the Bible, of course, is just no stranger to comparison and it documents all over the place, people and their comparison issues. And so lucky for us, we get to then come and look to the Bible and see just how detrimental comparison really is. So there are two separate accounts in the Bible that I want us to focus on this week. There's a lot other, many more out there and we'll come across those, we'll, we'll look at those later on. But just to start, there's two of them that I want us to kind of figure out what type of comparison do we tend to fall into? So here we go. We are going to start off. The very first story that we are going to look at is in Genesis. It's chapter 29, and we're going to start in verse 14. And this is kind of a lengthy, it's a lengthy uh, story that we're going to look at, but it's really important because we're going to be allowed to see, again, just the multiple faces that comparison has. So we are going to start, we are looking at Jacob, who ends up, he is working for a relative. And as he's working for this relative, he falls in love with one of the his relatives, with, I believe it's his uncle, with his daughter. And so he wants to marry his daughter. And this situation arises and the uncle kind of gets scheming with him and, and gives him a, a, another daughter. He doesn't give him the right daughter. So we're gonna jump in and we're gonna look at this and just see how comparison shows up for these two sisters. So here we go. Genesis 29, verse 14. After Jacob had stayed with him for a whole month, Laban said to him, just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. So already right there, you're going to see a big situation that is going to allow for comparison to come in, you know, between these two sisters. Because Leah, when they said that she has weak eyes, basically they're saying that she is not attractive. But Rachel is. She is beautiful. So here you have a not so attractive, um, you know, sister. And then here you have a very beautiful and attractive sister. That's just like the perfect recipe, right, for comparison. And it gets worse. So let's keep going. So Jacob it was in love with, with Rachel, and he says, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed, and I want to lie with her. Like he just, like he's pulling no punches, right? He's being very honest. He's waited seven years. I think the guy's ready. So Laban brought together all the people of the, pal of the place and gave a feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and gave her to Jacob. And Jacob lay with her. And Laban gave his servant girl Zilpah to his daughter as her maidservant. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, 
It is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week. Then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished out the week with Leah and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant girl Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her maidservant. Jacob lay with Rachel also and he loved Rachel more than Leah and he worked for Laban another seven years. So here you go. Here's the next huge like bomb that's just going to cause comparison to run rampant. And that is the fact that Leah is deceivingly given to Jacob to be his, his wife by her father, nonetheless. And then he then receives Rachel as well. So now Jacob is married to both Rachel and Leah. And Leah knows that Jacob loves Rachel. He doesn't love her. So here comes all the comparisons, right? So we have just one more little portion to look at, and then we'll move on. It says, when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And here comes another one, right? Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now at last my husband will become attached to me, because I have bore him three sons. So he was named Levi. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. When Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. And we know that jealousy is seriously like it is the seed for comparison to just take root and just like go crazy, right? It will grow like like wild with that. So again, so when Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. So she said to Jacob, Jacob, give me children or I'll die. And so we're just going to end right there. And I know you guys can go on and and keep reading this story, but I'm just going to ask that you don't do it, that you wait until next week. But again, you've got to look at the setup there. There are so many components that can lead to these two sisters comparing themselves. And that's exactly what happens. So we're going to push pause right there. And then we're going to head over into the New Testament. And we are going to be in Luke. And we are in verse, or sorry, we're in chapter 18. And we're going to be in verses 9 through 14. And so this little portion is titled The Parable of the Pharisee and the Tax Collector. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Woo! That's like, yeah, I know, tense, especially because I tend to fall more into that category. So which one of these two scenarios can you relate to more? Are you more like, you know, this Pharisee who do you compare yourself favorably like like he did? Are you constantly seeing how you can be how you're better than other people by finding people that you can look at their lives and be like, oh, no, mine is much better than theirs or Are you like Leah and Rachel? Do you tend to compare yourself negatively? And and typically when we're comparing ourselves negatively, it's because we are so focused on what we do not have and what somebody else has. And so we use that and we just 
like we can't, we can't see anything else. And so we compare ourselves and we see, I do not measure up. I will never be this. I will never be good enough. And it just eats away at us. So this is really where we're going to land for this week. And we're just going to do like a quick, um, I know we want like the quick immediate solution. That's what we want, right? We want this answer of, okay, well, this is what I do. So how do I overcome it? And we're just not going to go there quite yet. And, but don't worry, we will. Don't, don't think that we're not going to do that. We, we will. But I really do want us to become uncomfortable with our ungodly behaviors. And I think that we truly should be offended by our sin. Because when we let it bother us the way that it should, we are much more likely to get serious about it and to do what God actually calls us to do regarding sin. And that is to repent. And that word repent, really, it does mean just to to turn back to God. It means to stop doing what we're doing and turn around and come back to God. Because God always has, has truth. He always has what is good and right and best for us. So that's really where we are going to just kind of land the plane this week. And we just are going to stay here in this place. And I want us again to look at how do I, how do, how do I compare myself? Emma, is it the favorable thing? Is it the negative thing? Is it both? I do both all the time, but I think I definitely tend to lean more towards trying to, you know, compare myself favorably so that I can feel better about myself. So that's what we're going to do. And then next week, I want you to come back because we are, again, we're just going to keep, you know, digging things up and we're going to keep looking at this. And we are going to find out by God's word, according to his word, how do we overcome this comparison trap? So thank you ladies so much for being here. As always, I appreciate you. I love you dearly. And I hope you have a wonderful week.